Welcome to our chapter 5 video. Uh, hope you're doing well. Haven't uh, done a chapter video in a couple weeks, but, or no, I guess it's not been a couple weeks, but it's been a few days or whatever. But in this video, we're going to go deep into this idea of what's sort of happening in the brain and how what's happening in the brain is being observed through the shifting cognitive experience right if you want to think of like the physical development meaning like like obviously how the body's changing and stuff but sort of more specifically like how the brain's developing and the anatomy of the brain's changing and as that's changing it's accompanied by this related update in ability to do things right it's almost like as the hardware of the brain's updating the software is too and and this is uh, during this massive period of childhood, this is at like, um, you know, this is really when the, the brain gets the opportunity to express itself in this. Uh, I've made the argument in that biology chapter that the extended period of childhood and the fact that you're all smart adults go together and that when adult, when childhood can be this period of, of cognitive development, right? Like, what does that even mean? Like getting smarter, getting better linked between your brain and your body, everything from eye hand to ability to understand things like pattern recognition, um, that the hardware and the software go together. They, they co-evolve. All right. Welcome. Hope you're doing well. Thanks for your patience. I haven't, I haven't been the world's best this year. Um, you know, uh, my marking, I'm kind of slow on, although I, I'm about to get some out, and you all did really well, like, your stuff's fantastic, um, you know, I've been, like, less clear than I could have been in stuff, but, like, Scotty, come on, um, whatever, you know, I can beat myself up, or I can just try my hardest, and, and try to make this class as cool as I can for you, so, all right, let's, let's get into it. So as the kid's getting older, you have, you start to see like the kid starts to slim down in the, in the body, right? Meaning that like the child starts to lose a little bit of the, the head heavy look or like when kids are born their head. And again, it's, it's, it's not just that their head's big, it's that their head's big to facilitate the development or the ability to have this huge brain, right? This huge, this huge space for the brain. Stop, buddy. Leave the mixer alone, Scotty. DJ, my cat DJ here. Um, the head's still large compared to the rest of the body, and but during this period, most kids have sort of lost the. Uh, most kids have kind of lost the more uh, top-heavy look, right? Body fat shows this kind of slow, steadier decline during the preschool years. By middle and late childhood. Um, there's kind of more slow, continuous growth, right? So it's like, if you're looking at what's happening, the child's kind of like filling out, right? They're kind of growing into their body. They're like more literally growing into their head. And, and, uh, as, as we get later into childhood, the growth kind of slows down and gets more kind of consistent. Okay. And this is just kind of like, obviously super general. We're about to, in a second, get into more specifically the brain. So an interesting, uh, Have you guys caught that about me yet? Sometimes if I like start a new slide and uh, I'm not like 100% sure what I'm going to say, I'm like, the interesting thing about this is that, and then I have to like, I'm like hoping my brain will will finish the sentence for me. Hide and seek champion Bigfoot. Ah, Should have been more aware of my shirt. Uh, the brain and nervous system, yeah, change significantly. So it's like, I say that the overall size of the brain doesn't hugely change from three to five, but the patterns within it change. And it's like, well, that's basically like saying, um, well, it's like saying that like what I'm doing all my stuff with AI, right? That like I can take a open AI based brain model and then train it. And when I'm trained, when done training it, it's not the same. It's like maybe it didn't increase huge size wise, but how it, the inner workings. So it's like this idea that there's a size and complexity factor. So the brain's getting bigger, but it's also getting way more complicated. So overall, the size doesn't change massively. If you look like at a three year old, like my daughter, 
Charlotte's three right now, and if you look at her when she's five, her head's not going to be... Her brain's literal size isn't going to be all that much bigger, but then, the, but it's doing this massive thing of like that next point where it's like, in some areas there's massive development, but there's also massive pruning. So if you could have that somewhere in your notes, capture this idea of like one of the most massively interesting things about early, this early developmental period is the brain's like overproducing and massively pruning at the same time. So what that means is like, and it's such a beautiful design or, or creation or however you want to say it, but it's like this idea that like. Your brain's not just your brain. Your brain's overproducing what it needs. And then with the idea that some of it's going to work and some of it's not going to work, right? So it's like your brain's building all these connections. And then the connections that are being used are going to be getting myelinated, or we could call that hardwired. And then the ones that aren't going to be used eventually get, they will, we call it synaptic pruning, but it's not like something's literally cutting them. They just literally don't get activated for long enough and they kind of fizzle away and die. So instead of really thinking of it as like it getting cut, parts getting cut out, that's just like a metaphor, right? Like pruning like a bonsai tree. It's like, well, there's no real cutting happening. What's really happening is a dying away almost, right? Like, uh, yeah, I guess a loss of tissue until whatever the cell is like isn't holding its shape anymore. And then just becomes like cellular waste that gets caught in the blood. Like I'm just trying to not skip past the fact that just because we have words for this, that's mind blowing. Like it's it's mind blowing that what your brain does is create. And again, I don't mean to always talk about AI. It's like a joke with my Kitchener students. Like you guys should have like a that my Kitchener students. I joke with them. They're they're an awesome group. I, I have about 30 students this year, and they're all cool. And that's like. I joke about them that they should have like a drinking game for every time I mention AI, but um, it's because it's kind of my hobby, right? And you realize like AI and developmental psychology go so heavily together because AI is at a developmental stage. Um, yeah, and if you're smart and you can code as a developmental psychologist, you'll be one of the best coders immediately. So, <clears throat> my point though, the reason I brought up the AI thing is like, if I wanted to create an awesome AI, that's what I would do. I would give it every single skill possible and then I would cut away the stuff I didn't need. Now that's a, the problem with that though, is that's a really resource heavy approach, right? Like the most efficient way to build something would be only have the things you need. It's actually, it actually takes a lot of energy for your brain to pr overproduce basically and then bonsai. But that's how it gets so advanced. That's why you're what you are. That's why I can sit here and make sounds through my throat and connect it through this mic and it travels somehow through space and well through, uh, through fiber optics to your computer and you can listen to the sounds and hear them as words and write notes in your page because you have a well-developed prefrontal cortex and so do I and they're communicating right now from three to six there's tons this is the other thing I was saying to my class the other day in Kitchener is that it was about a different topic but this concept that the brain's not building at the same speed everywhere it's building at different speeds right so you have like say for example as soon as the kid's born the visual processing unit is like super building like at this time of development during this kind of three to six period you see tons of development in the prefrontal cortex so that's like just think of a frontal mean cortex means a bunch of like brain cells together that are doing a certain thing and then the front means like obviously the front and then the prefront means like in front of the front the prefront cortex like right between your eyes basically right here it's like if that part gets hurt it's like the part heavily associated with your personality and who you are and why I say that is because if you hurt got really hurt there like in a car accident your friends would probably notice a change in your personality and because a lot of your your the kind of optical aspect of your prefrontal cortex is there the part of you that thinks that it's you right if I was to say like what's well, really you you're probably not gonna like point at your elbow you probably think it's like somewhere sort of in the middle front of your head just intuitively the optical prefrontal cortex so 
that slide went a bit into deep water, but let's move on to the next one. Love you guys, you're and girls. I know it's mainly a uh, mainly female class, but uh, I appreciate you. Good people. All right, let's keep going. Okay. So this first point's worded weird because it's sort of saying the same thing. Like less diffusion and more focal activation is sort of saying the same thing. Like it's saying it's less spread out and more focused. So they're saying basically that what research is showing is that between this time period of like 7 and 30, you see a lot of activation in this prefrontal cortex, right? A lot of this brain hardwiring this like most complex part of itself. This is where there's this like old, you always hear people say like, oh, you know, the reason, sorry, I'm like, whenever I listen to it, I'm like, man, could I just like sit still for half a second? I'm like, half of the sounds that you guys hear are chair sounds, but sorry for that. Um, it's not like you, when you're 21, it's not like if we were to see your brain, you don't have part of this brain. It's like, so when people say it takes till like your mid twenties for it to fully develop, what do they mean? They mean like the wiring part, right? Like you've heard me say this before. And, um, I just don't want to grab my mic cord because it's going to mess it up. But like if I take two cords and I touch them together, right? If I was to take like say this cord, which isn't plugged into anything, and touch it into some other cord, it's like, well, why isn't it all shorting out? It's like, well, because they have plastic on the outside, just like any two cords you have sitting there, right? It's like, well, that plastic outside is what allows them to not short each other out. It's like your brain has that too, but that coating is what we call myelin. And we've talked a little bit about that, and I can just see on my next slide I'm going to talk about that. But so you, what I'm, this is my super long-winded way of saying, when you hear somebody say that um, early, someone in their early 20s brain isn't fully developed yet, what they really mean is like the wiring job's not fully myelinized yet. That the fat coating on the outside of the literal uh, neural connections in that part of the brain aren't fully materialized yet, right? So it's like some of the cords aren't fully protected. And until they're fully protected and kind of fully finished, it's not like firing perfectly yet or as efficiently or as smoothly and as it will. Right, so now this is interesting. It's like as this part of your brain is getting stronger, your ability to like do better at things and pay attention longer and cognitive control sort of means like doing what you want to do even when you don't want to. Right, it's like imagine if I have to sit here in class. Hopefully it's not for you, but like let's say right now you're like super bored with what I'm talking about, but you're like, but no, I have to like finish watching this and do the quiz or whatever. And it's like, so you force yourself to do it even though you don't want to. Well, that's cognitive control. And part of your, as you get older, one of the ideas is that, and if you're like, well, I don't know if I'm better than that. It's like, well, you're definitely better than that than like my three-year-old, right? And if we just make go a bit extreme with the age example, it becomes obvious that one of the things that we're talking about is that really here is that there's a difference between intelligence and attention. It's like one thing to be smarter than someone, but it's another thing to be able to pay attention to something for longer than somebody. Both things will make you outperform them, right? focal activation can you stay focused on something right that's kind of using that word in a different context but this idea that basically what i'm trying to say is the developing hardware of the brain is making the child giving the child more skills like basically just being able to point the laser of their concentration longer right concentration what's what's can you control your centration can you control what you're focused on Right? It's like your intelligence is your brain is the power of your laser and then the attention is like the aim of your laser of your mind. Okay, so just to keep going with this myelination thing, right? That like myelination is occurring yeah, to eye hand, right? And you think like, okay, if you throw me something, you throw me this cord and I like boom, I catch it in my hand with an amazing and then I stumble it and it hits the floor and I should restart the slide. I don't want to present as somebody that can't catch a cord that they throw up and watch themselves try to catch in a mirrored video. It's actually kind of funny to think of it that way because if I throw it and try to catch, it's weird, right? Because this is my right hand, but it feels like that would be my left hand. And it's like, but if I did that enough times, 
and I just kept doing it by not looking at my hands, but by looking at myself in there where it's flipped, eventually I'd be able to do it. And eventually I'd get awesome at it. And eventually, and that's why. Well, because my brain would learn to interpret that visual stimulus in a way that made it so that it signal that it sent to my hand and put my hand in a position to catch it. My eye-hand coordination would improve. And it's like, well, okay, why did I go on that rim? Well, I'm trying to get to this kind of cool, hopefully, angle of, like, eye-hand coordination is pretty wild. It's pretty wild that what it really is is your ability of your brain to tell your hand what to do immediately through a signaling mechanism. All through your nervous system. Yeah, and so this myelination related to focusing attention seems to be more completed uh, near the middle or late childhood. Myelination, especially in the prefrontal cortex, not complete until late adolescence or early adulthood. Sort of what I was just talking about on the previous slide. I'll leave this up for a second just so you can get it. Yeah, so it's like it's not... You almost look at and I think I talked about this in the biology presentation but you can almost slow down and break out down the brain into like th four things right the brain the baby's born and all these cells that can process information that we call neurons come together and they get into this kind of shape and we call that shape a neural tube and that neural tube eventually starts making way more of those cells right way more brain cells we call that neurogenesis and then those brain cells move into their location. We call that neuromigration, or basically just migration means moving. And then they connect. And that's called neural connectivity, or basically like the wiring of your brain. You think about it, that's actually wild. That what the brain does is it, like cells come together, make way more of themselves, move into location, and then connect. Again, it's probably the most complicated piece of tissue in the universe that we know of. I just got this like um, little piece here to read to you. It's like you can just, if you want to just jot down the bullet points on the screen there. What I'm going to read is just like a little bit more extended of it. But this idea that like as the kid's getting older, right? I had just on the last slide talked about the eye hand thing and uh, missed the catch. But start to think like the eye foot things even more impressive right and we think of we don't really use the term eye foot but that's walking and that the kid's starting to walk too and then you start to realize like well that's actually huge because now all of a sudden you realize that as as a kid you're like or as a parent i remember when i had my first kid and yeah, it's, 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 as soon as i start talking about being a parent i all of a sudden feel like more tired and i start rubbing my eyes and oh it's like when i'm not talking about it i forget for a sec it's like, oh, I was, <laughs> I was 20 once too. Um, sorry, I'll, t I'll try not to have like a full uh, midlife crisis right in front of you, but I'm actually not as crazy as I probably come across. <sighs> when you go down one of these like personal, <laughs> oh, thank you, Sir Microphone, you're a good listener. It's like, this is a, probably a good time to restart the slide, but whatever. Yeah, I foot. It's like, no wonder a kid takes almost two years to learn how to walk. That's the longest neural connection that they'll ever make, right? That's like literally your brain being able to send messages to your feet, being able to do things like kick a soccer ball. It's like, that's actually, it's like being able to kick the ball with one foot without falling down actually requires quite a bit of balance, quite a bit of, um, Propio, propio, what's the word? Proprioception, like knowledge of where your body is, like being able to control your weight. So like, you you learn this when you're hurt too. You realize when you're hurt, if you've ever hurt your leg, that like going down the stairs is way bigger of an issue, because you realize that actually, and you see that with kids when they're learning, right? Like kids will usually learn to go upstairs way earlier, because going upstairs you're like climbing. Going downstairs it's like a controlled fall. Like you like let your leg go. And it's, you, sh you don't realize until you have a kid how much walking downhill, I mean, well, downhill in general, but downstairs is like a controlled fall. And it's like, just to go one more step on that, anyone that's ever hurt their knee, the reason why going downstairs sucks is because there's a, if you view your knee, right, like, like this is going to be a 
brutal example because I didn't prepare to do this. But say this is like my leg, my upper leg. I don't know how to do this. And this is my low leg. And, and my knee goes like this, right? It's like my leg, ha my your knee has to like straighten. Basically just walking downstairs, put your, your knee in a very sensitive position that you don't realize until you're you have a knee issue and then you realize going upstairs is no problem going downstairs is brutal some people like actually hold their pants so that 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 drag when your legs momentarily hanging doesn't rip at the top of the knee <clears throat> i somehow have made it into my early 40s never really hurting a knee um you know, I've struggled a bit with my hip, but like at different times. But yeah. Knees. Okay. How's that for just a random rant? Okay, let's get back to the topic. So around three, uh, children enjoy, I was, my goal is to be less ranty today. Children enjoy simple movements such as hopping and jumping and running back and forth just from the sheer delight of performing the movement. Um, the delight in showing how they can run across the room and, and jump, even if it's just a small amount. By four, kids are enjoying similar activities, but they're becoming more adventurous. They're scrambling over the jungle gyms and displaying their athletic prowess. I'm not sure why I said it like that. That might be right from the book. Although they have been able to climb stairs with one foot uh, and jump on one foot for a while, they're begin being able to climb downstairs now the same way. Yeah. So what I, I want, again, this is like I'm like five minutes into the slide, but I want to sort of hopefully try to hit you with this point that what's interesting is that the kids' movement getting smoother and their, them getting more coordinated goes together, but getting more coordinated and their inner wiring getting better is saying the same thing. Okay, so if you look at this girl in the picture, you can picture that like, and obviously this is just a picture I think from the book but I can't remember this looks like just a picture of a girl helping her dad change tire right and so as she's trying to take off those lug nuts she's like putting the tool on right and to do that she has to like hold it the right way and then she has to once the tension's right you have to keep it straight because if it's too much of an angle it's not going to get on so it's like you start to realize that that like that actually controlling like this it's like try to get robot hands to do something super fine again it's like the reason i always use the robot and ai examples is because it's like it's not until you try to train something else to do it that you realize the fact that you have like this like really dexterous hand movements like i don't i'm just trying to like just show like i could go in any direction it's like ah it's like speed bag but speed bag was that's a boxing reference but yeah it's like you start to realize that you actually have incredible dexterity with your hands and that's all signaling 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 it's incredible electrical signaling incredible electrical signaling and if you're practicing kung fu and you're practicing you're really just practicing the signaling mechanism between your brain and your hands and your arms and your body and you're becoming more coordinated coordinated and coordinating coordinated is like the physical realization of your wiring system almost it's a weird don't don't write that in your note that was a weird sentence okay um <laughs> that should be my new saying don't put that in your note i don't know why i went like this like i'd say it on a t-shirt um yeah, by the time the kid's three, they've been able to pick up little objects with their thumb and fingers for a while now. When they're like three years old, starts to play with a simple jigsaw puzzle. They're more rough with the pieces. They're like less gentle. It's like my daughter right now. She's like Godzilla hands, right? She like picks something up. She's like, boof, 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 boof. let me see this break. It's like, well, part of it is like, well, it's not that she's Godzilla hands, although I, I just freestyled that, but that's actually an awesome nickname for her. Because she is like that. It's like, Daddy, can I see this? And I give it to her, and she, like, takes it and, like, breaks the thing. And it's like, well, because she doesn't, it's not, she doesn't have that fineness yet. She will. She will. She will in about a year. And, again, that's developmental psych psychology for you right there. That she will 
be in a different skill set position in a year. Well, that's a weird thing to say because, or it's, well, it's not a weird thing to say because time matters, age matters, development is age within an organism's lifespan, right? So, lifespan. So if, I've said this a few times, this is sometimes you have to hear this a couple times to get it, and, and me too, it's like, wild to think that what development really means is that you're born and you live your life, hopefully a long, healthy life, but you're born with the potential to develop into something. More literally, you were originally a cell that was fertilized with the potential to become something. And development is the manifestation of the development or the manifestation of, of potential of this life, right? And then you put, you say like, okay, well, if I develop, this is the whole evolution idea is that there, I have to live to or be old enough to have kids and then also be able to find a mate, right? So that survival of the fittest sort of meets sexual selection because that's the part no one ever wants to talk about. But there's survival of the fittest and sexual selection there's two major selection pressures people rarely talk about the second one right because it's, it's less comfortable and so it's, it's like well it's the one area where everyone's massively allowed to discriminate you're allowed to only date certain people so that and so does every species that we know of right so there's a part of it that is how well the genetics meet the situation and then it's how well they meet the situation plus if they're selected by the opposite member and again right it's like people's it's like remember i'm not i'm talking this natural selection is relevant for earthworms okay let's keep going so also i wanted to say this to you too but i kind of wanted to bury it in the presentation and what I mean by that is, like, I, I didn't want to make a huge deal of it, and I didn't want to, uh, you know, start the video with it and kind of hog the show, but you might have noticed on um, the site, there's a video that hasn't that I didn't link to the course site that's called Timeless Wisdom about the book I wrote um, that's on Amazon now, and if you're interested in checking it out, check it out, and if you want a copy of the book, just message me and I'll send you a free copy. I can send it to you as like um, a Word document, a PDF, uh, EPUB, or a Mobi. Mobi is probably what I'll send it to you as if you want to read it as like MOBI, which is like how you would probably read it in your Kindle. I can send it as a Kindle file too, um, but for free. Like I, I'm definitely, please know my, it's actually like I view it as actually a conflict of interest to push content on you that's not content but like for pay stuff right like i want zero of my students buying my books uh if any of my students are interested in my stuff um again like i'd be i'd be thrilled to just shoot you the file right like i have it all as files my second book on the flood myths myths i'm not using that word actually echoes of the flood I'm actually playing with several titles, but the book's done. It'll be coming out soon. Um, go to mainlandgpt.com, the hottest source for. <laughs> oh, my, my daughter would be so embarrassed to see me do that. Okay, but honestly, like I'm like a 43 year old going through a bit of a midlife crisis with AI. I'm not trying to sell books to students. That to me is like the lamer than lame. Um, if any of you students that are like, you know, when you're in your 20s and you're trying to make ends meet, I'm not trying to sell you a $30 book. Like, I'll, I would love to just give me any of your stuff. But you should also check out Athena, the GPT AI I made. And that is linked to it. It's like, it's, it's better than the other AIs out there. And that, that's just getting started anyways. Okay, so now, could I get more off topic? Piaget. Man, Piaget would have loved AI. AI is also a gift 
to people that struggle with things like ADD and ADHD and struggle with organizational or any kind of, um, well, I'm going to get to learning disabilities in this presentation, but just this idea that like learning disabilities by definition means you're at least above um, average intelligence. Right, like if somebody had a really low intelligence, it would just be considered a cognitive impairment. It wouldn't be considered a learning disability. A learning disability is when your IQ is high, but your performance is in a way that, based on your IQ, I would think you would do better. Right, but again, I'm like stealing from later in the presentation, but for whatever reason, for issues around re usually reading, writing, or processing, basically thinking about it. Um, cause think about what processing means, right? We say like some kid has like a processing speed problem. It's like, well, what's that really mean? It's like, again, that's obviously a, a comparison to like a computer and saying basically like the, it's buffering. There's like, there's, there's the processing needed to compete, complete the action, which whether it's like maintain conversation or do the thing that they're trying to do is not, it's still buffering when it needs to be done. Which, you know, is, is tough because it's tough to tell it to somebody because that's symbolically true, but not actually true. There's no part in their brain that's buffering. They're... See, I just like, I'm like four minutes into the slide and I'm like stumbling into a me trying to create a new definition of learning disability but I think it's the problem is telling people that they're a certain thing that's a way of talking about it that's not actually a thing it's like you're not weird you're, there's nothing wrong with you what, what what it is is that your IQ is getting your your ability to fully express your intelligence is being interfered with and that interfering is often something related to whether it's dyslexia and it's like literally how you're visually seeing it. And so then because the visual distortion, it's actually interfering with. So the problem is at the sensation level. Well, it's kind of at where sensation meets perception. So then how you think about it, there's the distortions right from the beginning or whether it's a processing disability where you can sit in class and sort of understand but then as soon as you go to do the test it's like you forget what people were just talking about but if someone re-explained it to you you would be fine that's a good example of like a processing disability or not even see again disability like that's it's just such a loaded word right what does it really mean it means well again because my brain's like that and you probably you kind of experienced the good and the bad of it as my students right is like sometimes I go on these wild rants and sometimes it leads to a cool point and sometimes it leads to a dead end and it's like well the problem is turning off one sort of turns off the other it's like it's hard to be like a speaker that sort of goes with the flow and tries to be kind of interesting and never have dead ends it's like unless you're unless you hire an editor um I said to, I'm having such deja vu because it wasn't even that long ago, but I was actually talking about this idea to my Conestoga students. Because um, really, I teach developmental psychology at, at Conestoga and at a college level, I teach similar style content, not not like literally the same slides, but like it's, it's like a developmental psychology course at a college is still going to talk about Freud and, and Piaget and all these all these giants of psychology um I, the main difference is I, I test and assign you guys harder stuff um but i was talking about this pre-operational right what does that mean and it's like what i, I said to this chris guy i'm like hey chris if, how many uh court if how many dollars are eight quarters it's like that's kind of easy question right? it's like two bucks it's like okay well but how did you do that so to do that you had to be in your head okay well you said eight quarters, and I said it kind of weird. I said, how many do dollars are in eight quarters? So then you're like, okay, a dollar's four quarters, and I said eight. So then if I was to make two groups of four, that would be eight. So then it's two, and I know, like, you probably did it way faster than that, but I was just trying to, trying to play it out. That whole playing it out is an operation, right? It's like me thinking several processes in my head. What Piaget's saying is that 
younger kids aren't doing that as much. As they get closer to seven, they're doing it more. So here's the example. I'm like saying that they're they're more right now. They're they're not as pre-operational. I mean, they're not as like sensory motor as a little kid, but they're still like they're starting to be able to represent the word their world with words and images and draw, and they have more stable concepts. But their reasoning skills, their ability to hold and manipulate complex ideas in their brain operations isn't as developed as later and so much so that that's probably the main difference between like a six-year-old and a 10-year-old is their ability to do that work in their head right so like here's the example i like to give and then i promise that i'll move to the next slide if i'm driving down the road right let's say it's a uh winter day and it's like stormy and let's say it's like right around christmas and there's cars everywhere and stuff and let's say like it's really busy traffic and it's a busy situation and i'm trying to get to fairview mall like the busy mall in kitchener and like everything's like busy 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 and then my kids are like arguing about something in the back and i'm like i'm just making up a scenario here. i'm like guys would you be quiet can't you understand that blah 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 i'm in this scenario and that when you guys are arguing it's making me stress out and that your behavior is affecting me and it's like no they can't think that they're not especially my three-year-old, my three-year-old is not at a place where they're cognitively able to empathize my, or like not even empathize, but like imaginatively experience in their brain what my experience must be like and use that to inform their behavior. It's like my seven, my my uh, eight-year-old might be getting able to do that, but it's too much to ask the three-year-old. They just cognitively can't do that. And with that, I promise to end the slide. Okay, so check out this. This is called the mountain, uh, the three mountain task. Okay, you can see it at the bottom of the image. It says that name. So you see this is like three mountains, right? One has a cross on the top. One has a, like a red cylinder on the top. And the other one's just the big one that doesn't have anything on the top. And what you see is that, okay, if you look at it from different angles, picture that as a tabletop, right? So if you're looking at it from the one side, you see it a different way if you move so this would be like the one side of it then there's another side then there's like the opposing side and then there's the other side right picture a table there's like the two heads of the tables and then the two sides so what you do is you have a kid sit in all the spots and see what it looks like from all the spots and then you have them you take their doll and you set it at one of the other chairs and you ask them what you think their doll sees Right, And what you're trying to get to, I'm going to read a better description in just a second, but what you're trying to get to is, can the kid tell you what they think their doll sees, or is the kid just going to tell you what they see? And what you find is basically that once kids get to a certain age, they get much better at being able to be like, well, my doll is actually sitting on the other side of the table, so that doll's not seeing what I'm seeing, they're seeing this, but that... A younger kid's worse at that. My three-year-old wouldn't be good at that. My three-year-old would probably tell you what they what she sees. Charlotte would tell you what she sees. Because she's not able to yet play that game of hold my thought here. Let me pretend to be this person. Answer from their perspective. That perspective taking. It's like she's, so, she's not able to take your perspective because she's so concentrated and centered on her. Centration. Centered and centr... Sorry, just to like... I'm kind of overkilling, but this is because of the word on the slide, right? Centration. Center. So then egocentrism. Remember, ego is like this old word in psychology that meant um, self. All right? So, so someone like Piaget, he's using the old use of the word ego. Remember, when people like, I keep saying, remember, remember, as if you keep forgetting and you're not, you're, you're not a live audience. Um but it's just a form of speech, right? But what I was going to say about remember is that Anna Freud's book was called The Ego Psychology. Ego meant like self, like this idea of I'm I'm self-focused, but it's not because I'm like negative. It's not like this idea that I, I'm like arrogant and that's why. It's because at this age, the child's just at a developmental stage that they're, everybody's like that. You were like that too. You were seeing it from your perspective through your movie. Your life is your movie. You seeing your life as your own movie is sort of like the egocentrism idea, but like so much more so the case that. Well, that 
like okay this is a weird way to say it but think of it in the reverse if i say like the ability to take another person's perspective is something that you get when you get older well then before you get that you must not have that so what does that mean it means you can only see it from your perspective egocentrism and it's like that's always the case i'm 43 years old it's not like i don't see things through my own eye i'm an embodied physical being right like it's a weird way to say it too but like i'm like a by the fact that I'm a human being, I part of my life feels like it's Mike's movie and it's about me. And, that, and I know that all of you sort of feel that too. Now, the difference about being at 43 is I can tell that that's an experience that you have too. I don't think that it's that my movie is the movie. So Piaget and his student um, Inderhel initially studied young children's egocentrism by devising this three mountain task. The child walks around the table with a model of the mountains and becomes familiar with what the mountains look like from different perspectives. They can see that the different that there's different objects on the mountain. The child's then seated on one side of the mountain. The experimenter moves a doll to different locations around the table and at each location asks the child to select from a series of photos the picture that most accurately shows the view that the doll is seeing. Children in the pre-operational stage will often pick their own view rather than the doll's view. So basically that's saying like the younger the kid, the more likely the kid's going to make the mistake. So this and the next couple slides are part of Piaget's argument for like, he's trying to say that kids don't just think more or smarter or less smart. They think in total different ways. And one of the total different ways of this kind of childhood stage is this egocentrism, this egocentrism almost said it really weird there this egocentrism this like failure or not failure but this hyperization of your own perspective and then the, but it's not even it's so natural it's so natural that it's just what it is like you have to be able to watch your own movie before you can understand that everyone has a movie i'm not trying to make it sound like that was a super deep comment but it's kind of interesting right So have you ever had uh, the funny joke I like for this is like, have you ever stubbed your toe on the door or on something and or on a piece of furniture and gotten like super mad at the piece of furniture? It's like the, um, I'm trying to think of what would a good example be. <laughs> this is so annoying. In my bathroom upstairs, the handle has this like, it's like almost like trying to be fancy and it's like a kind of like a stick that has like a little bit of a J at the end. And every once in a blue moon, it's like the stars are aligned and I just am going at the right speed and it catches a belt buckle. So like I've had it where I'm walking past and all of a sudden I like bump the door a little bit and it goes into like the back part of my jeans and the belt buckle and just like dead stops me like. And I just, like, want to rip the door off it because it, like, hurts. Not really hurts, but, like, you know what I mean? Like, if you ever got snagged on something, it's, like, this is my long-winded way of saying, like, that tendency to see something as, like, having a personality that doesn't. Like, it's, like, the do that, that handle on the door, like, is just a piece of steel. It obviously doesn't. It's not, like, out to get me. But damn, it feels like it when it, like, slams me into the wall and, like, twists up my pants and, like, almost basically, like, puts a wrestling move on me because of my own speed. Or it's like the, the kid, this is not the best example because the dog's actually alive, but the dog's not, like, really a person, right? It's like the kid talking to the dog like it's a person or the kid, like, my, I can see my daughter, like, getting hit by the swing and being mad at the swing or, like animism tit it's like where the word uh well it's obviously like connected to the word animal or animate but to anima that the, the, the anna a, adam like this this um to breathe life the belief that inanimate objects could have life-like qualities okay so i'm gonna say three things so the ways that kids at this stage is thinking is sort of characterized the egocentrism of last slide the animism here and then one more
and then the last one that I want to talk about is this idea of conversion, right? Like, this is a good example of something that would totally um, not trick my eight-year-old, but would trick my three-year-old. And for this specific presentation, my kids are sort of at an interesting age, right? Because, like, I have one kid that's sort of just entered this kid stage, right? Like, my three-year-old who's kind of recently not an infant anymore. And then I have my set my eight-year-old eight going on 18 it feels like um <laughs> i wish i saw like red foreman from that 70s show there but no it's like yeah it's yeah it's like one minute you're changing their diaper, the next minute they're telling you they need space when they're putting their socks on. It's like my, my daughter must have heard that somewhere. Like, my three-year-old now needs space. It's like, she needs space. Daddy, I need space. I'm having my chips. I need space. And it's, it's just like she wants me to take, like, one step away. It's like, I don't know, it's cute. She kind of uses it incorrectly, but it's okay. Um. So, like, okay. Man, I got way off topic there. I'm trying to keep these slides shorter, but I hope that you... Uh, do you want me to just read the slides? Like, how brutal is that? Um, I'll try to keep them at least a little bit interesting. If you take this orange juice, right? And it's like... Oh, I was saying that my older daughter wouldn't be tricked by this, but my younger one would. If I took the one glass and I poured it into that tall cylinder, and then I gave her older sister the tall cylinder one, she, my, my younger daughter would be mad about that. Like, why is... Why does Evie get the bigger one? It's like, well, you just saw that it's the same amount of juice in both. It's like, well, it doesn't matter. Because my daughter, Evelyn, the eight-year-old, will be able to see that I take this and I pour it into this. And it's the same amount. It's just in a different cup. But the the switch, the conversion from one to the other is almost like tricking the younger kid, right? And that he calls that conservation. That conservation, so like think about like what a conservation, if you want to conserve the woodlands or something, it means like protect it or to like keep it alive or conserve it, keep it the same actually is what it means. Keep it the same. So if you put the orange juice from one to the other, it's still the same amount of orange juice. It's con There's a, a conservation of mass. So there's the same amount of orange juice, even though it looks different. Right. And it's like all of you that are listening to me explain this and you're in your 20s, you're like, yeah, no kidding. My point is that when you were four, that's a more complicated topic. And the and the fact that it's more complicated is like specifically one of the things that's more complicated. OK, so I have a cool picture to show you on the next slide. Right. So this is like saying, OK, so the, here you have the initial presentation. You have two identical rows of objects are shown to the child who sees that there's like eight balls, blue balls. And then it's like, OK, so now one row's lengthened and now there's eight blue balls on that side. And it's like the child's in the pre-operational stage is most likely to answer that. Yeah, it looks like that, um, that there's more on the right side. And that the two identical clay balls are shown to the child. The child agrees that they're the same size. This is the important thing, right? Is that at the beginning, the kid's agreeing. So in both scenarios, it's like you show it to the kid and you say, okay, well, these are the same, right? And then you spread the one out and it looks like it's bigger. And they say, well, that's bigger. It's because like, even though they just saw it's the same, the fact that they just saw it's the same isn't affecting their second judgment. They're not conserving that information across operations. They're pre-operational to use his words but you can see that those two sticks are the same length but when you put them apart it's hard for the child's mind to not see the top one is longer because longer things reach farther right even though it's like clearly got a head start that's the same amount that it's longer but see the Important thing is if you look under this like initial presentation column on the left and it says that under each one where they agree they have the same number, where they agree that it's equal, where they agree that it's the same length, and then you move it just a bit right in front of them. And all of a sudden one's bigger than the other. And it's like, well, that's actually like a, a failure for them to see that changing the situation doesn't change the amount, sort of. 
changing the presentation doesn't change the amount that flattening it out and lengthening it it's still the same amount and that's called conservation okay so then I think I've probably already touched on Vykovsky, but like Vykovsky's I think I could argue too that he's the most important Russian psychologist. He's one of the most important psychologists. This whole idea of like if I need to if I want to teach you, I need to know where you're at. I need to know your zone of proximal development. I need to know what's possible for you and what's possible for you with help and what's too much for you. I need to know the task range from too difficult for a child to master their own but can be learned with guidance of a, an adult or a more skilled child. What it's really saying is that like there's what you can do by yourself and what you can do with help. There's a certain amount of a good writer you could be totally by yourself and if you had an amazing writing coach you could be a certain amount better. And that gap is your zone of development. It's like there's a certain amount of good you could be as an adult as an adult as an athlete and with really good coaching you could be a certain amount better that's your zone of development there's a certain amount of how good you could be as a person like i just accidentally said or not as an adult and then if you had like a good mentor you could be better that's your zone of development so your zone of development is the difference in the space between what you can do by yourself and what you could do with really good help and the idea is that that's actually understanding this Vykovsky zone of proximal development. Again, it's a tongue twister. Zone of proximity development. Proximal development. Proximal is just means the distance between. Understanding the distance between what the person can do and what they can do with help is key to their development. Because you aim at that. So it's like, okay, if I want to help you become the best writer I can help you become, I have to know exactly how good you are. And then I have to have the ability to kind of imagine how good you could be in the proper scenario. And then I have to, so say if I'm like, okay, you could be like a, I'm just going to use numbers. Like you could be a 50, you are a 50 and you could be like a 70. So now I aim you at like a 67. I owe you, I aim you a little bit lower, right? And it's like, so you're always aiming towards the top of the zone of the proximal development. It's like, let's apply this in another context. Let's pretend we're like coaching gymnastics or hockey or something. It's like, you want to know sort of what the kid can kind of do on their own. And then if you were to push them super hard, what they could do, and then back off a bit from that. And that's when you put a kid in the best position to learn. A kid, an adult, uh, anything. Remember, this is like a learning theory. So this is, again, I want to say that these get, these guys weren't just like throwing out random ideas. Like Vykovsky is one of the most important scientists in history. He was, they were, his ideas were used to train soldiers. Like this idea that, of course, they were used to train soldiers. He was heavily relevant to the Russian war efforts during the Cold War. This is training. You have to, you have to know who you're training and what you're trying to train them in. And how you model that training experience matters. Okay, so this is going to bring us to the next concept. Yeah, I know it's it's sometimes kind of weird to bring in like the war-related topics, but I think it's also important for students to realize that that goes hand in hand with the history of psychology, largely because what would happen between the state like this, what happened between the states and Russia is if it's like old news. It's like even what's happening now is like just bubbling old stuff. It's like all it's like people say it's like you, you're not going to understand right now unless you understand what happened during, you know, like the the desert storm war eras. And you're not going to understand that unless you understand Korea and Vietnam. And you won't understand that unless you understand World War Two. And you have no chance of understanding World War Two unless you understand World War One. And that makes no sense unless you understand the history of the how the French and the Germans and the, the Brits interacted and what was the role of some of the Eastern European states and who was, you know, who were the black hand, this like secret society. And it basically started World War One. It's like, again, I'm just getting so off topic. I don't even know how I got to that. Okay. 
Oh yeah, just I was saying this idea of like these these things are so interconnected. These people were huge people. Someone like Freud was a rock star. It's like I mean that like literally. Like there's a cool book I read in the, a couple years ago that was called The Kingmaker, and it was about a guy named Stanley uh, not Stanley Milgram, um, Stanley Hall, and you might have heard of him because he's the guy that like kind of normalized not normalized that, that almost sounds like a pun but he he normalized the word norms right that like oh it's normal for or it's the norm for a kid to start talking at this time and for a kid to do this at this age and there's all these developmental milestones kind of comes from him and they called him the kingmaker because he, he had this conference at i think he was at the university of minnesota or michigan or i want to say an m word maybe it was mad uh Madison, Wisconsin. Yeah, I think that's it actually, because that's a big one, because that's where that's where we get like Harlow and Maslow from later. And then, so anyway, so he brings them over for this big conference, Freud and Young, and and kind of made them the kings. That's why this book's called Kingmaker, because you have to think of Hall as like at that time probably America's most famous psychologist, bringing over these two European rock stars at the time. This is when Young and Freud were cool. Well, this is when they were starting to not get cool, but... Right, because they had, like, the, the most famous breakup in psychology. They never dated, I don't mean in that sense, but, like, Freud was... Or Jung was Freud's best student. And basically... It basically all fell down over this idea of, like, what dreams are, and, like, is there really... Is it all just this, like... and And... You know, is there, do we have this deep connection with this like mystical past and is there legend and were cave paintings and it's like, and Freud's just telling him, no, 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 like stick with the hard science, right? And yeah, they're two of the most fascinating people. So anyway, so Vykovsky's making this argument that whether you're training soldiers or whether you're like doing any kind of training, that training environments, what matters and these guys that are building here right what, what scaffolding is is it's it's temporary steel structure that you build around a building right so say if you're like you want to build an addition on this on the second floor of the building but you can't just obviously stand in the midair and just like nail stuff you have to have something to stand on to build an addition to the outside of the upper layer of a building so you have to like build a temporary thing to stand on basically while you're working on it and to get stuff up and to it's like what, what these people are doing, right? So you see how it's like basically a steel structure with these like um, whatever skids or whatever that they are standing standing platforms. And then as you build it higher, you build the scaffolding higher. And then once the thing's built, you take it down. It's like, well, you keep kind of building the kid's skills. And as the kid gets better, you kind of keep changing where you're giving your help. Just like, you know, it's it doesn't keep working on the same first level when the kids when the building's getting higher, it's moving up with the building. You're moving up with the kid. Kind of getting lost between metaphor and example. But the idea is that what you're trying to do as a teacher is figure out where you are and keep the carrot a little bit ahead of you. You're getting a bit better. Okay, now I'm going to implement and change a little bit so I keep pushing you. It's like it's the same way that you raise a kid and teach them to do something. It's the same way you coach a team. It's like you're always trying to keep working. This is like the best way to train or anything is like you you keep trying to keep what you already have solid and slowly add new positive pieces slowly build it you're changing that support level you're adjusting the amount of guidance the child gets so here's another easy example of this and this is kind of dipping a bit lower in age wise but like the kid going to the bathroom on themselves it's like as they at first you're praising them just for going to the bathroom and then you're praising them for like going to the or, or just for telling you they have to go to the bathroom and then you're praising them for just going to the bathroom then you're praising them for like going to the bathroom and washing their hands and doing like the whole process and it's like you're you, you're kind of purposely and skillfully constantly changing the target and rewarding the most re the the most evolved step and that's how you do advanced behavioral shaping social construction that's how you use an environment to construct behaviors social construction now like i'm using like very calm examples right it's like well okay so let's take a way more intense example how do you make a killer soldier 
put him in a killer soldier development environment. So here's Vykovsky here. So he makes this point that like, he's a super smart guy, he's making the point that I can teach you nothing if you're not paying attention. I couldn't agree more with this. Um... So he says, okay, first things first, and this is almost like you can see similarities to someone like Carl Rogers and this like person centered idea that like the very, the most important step is to understand who you're working with, right? That like, if I was to try to help your entire class become better writers, I'd be useless. If I was to help any one of you to become a better writer, I'd be super helpful. And the reason for that is because you don't all need the same advice. You all need different advice. And so knowing exactly where you're at and what exactly you're good at and what exactly you struggle with is me assessing your ZBT, right? Your, I said that wrong here. ZPD, your zone of proximal development. Basically what you can do with or without help. And so what I do then is I teach towards the upper zone. And I sort of said this before. It's like another example I like to use about the uh, ZPD idea is like my daughter playing like a video game when she was younger, when she started playing video games and she'd play like Minecraft, right? And she started playing Minecraft and then a pop-up would come up and she wouldn't be able to read it. And so she couldn't play. But if I was like nearby and I would just be like, uh, press B and then she'd press B and then she could keep playing. And it's like with my help on like just a few hard parts, all of a sudden now she's like making whole worlds in Minecraft. And it's like what she could do with just that little bit of help was so much more than what she could do with no help. But I'm trying to explain this zone thing, right? So if you have, that's where like, and it doesn't need to be me. It's like she could have her cousin Milo, who's only a couple years older than her doing that same thing right he could be a skilled peer in that scenario it's like he can just read the pop-up boxes for her and then all of a sudden she can perform as if she's several levels higher than she currently is sort of and then again that last part so it's like uh place it in a meaningful context when she's playing with like her cousin and they're having fun and stuff it's like she wants to learn so if you can have the kid the reason why the example to video games is so easy is because video games know who Vykovsky is video game makers know who Vykovsky is video gamification is on it's like there's a reason why level six of mario world's harder than level two and it's specifically harder and level three was harder than level two and level four is going to be a bit easier than level five right that that level 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 it's like that's that's how you learn right and it's like well you don't think of playing video games is learning but it's like okay well if you went from not knowing how to play to knowing how to beat a super complicated level you learned how to play it and you learned how to play it because they really well structured your experience so that you didn't fail so much that you quit but it wasn't so easy that you got bored and that's actually super hard the schedule of reinforcement there is super hard but that's that's well, yeah, interesting. Okay, so let's keep going here. So I want you to think of this. This is kind of interesting, right? That like, I have here in the note that this has sort of been a bit of the pushback to Vykovsky and Piaget, right? That like, Vykovsky and Piaget kind of make this point that kids, and I think, again, it's interesting how things play out, that the truth is often sometimes a, an interesting combo where, like, there are stages, like, kids, and, like, I'm, as somebody, I'm stumbling with what I'm saying, because I'm kind of freestyling here, it's like, the AI, when it's, like, thinking a lot, it goes, it, like, kind of hiccups while it's, like, thinking, talking, it's like, I'm doing that, my daughter would say I'm glitching, but yeah, it's that, uh, there's, Piaget has this idea that it's like levels, right? But then some people say, well, okay, but is it really that? Or is it just that the kids getting like their attention is getting stronger? And as their attention is getting stronger, it's affecting performance. 
So there's actually an interesting argument here, right? It's like, well, one reason a nine-year-old does way better than a five-year-old is because a nine-year-old can pay attention way better. And if you gave me two people that have the same IQ and one person can pay attention longer, they're going to do way better at school than the other person. So, and then you realize that attention is actually a couple things, right? So I have here executive attention is like, how much can you, so paying attention is like noticing things and making decisions based on what you're noticing. And it's like kind of like how actively engaged you are right now. Are you paying attention or are you like kind of lost in space? So part of paying attention is sort of like alertness and right nowness, and like executive, we never talk about executive function or like the executive is the president. Theoretically, it's like, <laughs> theoretically, it's supposed to be the person making decisions. And it's like, so, and so your executive uh, part of your brain is like the part of your brain that's responsible for decision making, which is, and again, complicated because it's like, what does it mean to say that there's a part of your brain that makes decisions? Well, there's a part of your brain that's basically <clears throat> choosing one over the other. through complex electrical and chemical processes that you're largely unaware of. So there's there's that whole part, but then there's the staying at... It's like if I'm like talking to my kid and, and like how many people... This is going to sound annoying. I'm going to sound like an annoying dad here, but like the like look at me when I'm talking to you, it's like... Well, why do people say that? Because it's like when you have a kid and you're trying to tell them something and then they're like looking down at something or they're like not it, whether or not they're, my wife's like, my wife's annoying for this and she's not here so I can say this because she'll be like, oh, I am listening and she'll tell me right back what I said and I'm like, okay, so you technically showed me you were listening, but man, when I told you that you couldn't have been giving me like the nonverbals that you weren't listening more, right? It's like. If I was looking the way you're looking, I would be not listening. But, yeah, she's got a good memory for that kind of stuff. This is my awkward way of explaining sustained attention, right? So there's, like, part of the attention is is you paying attention sort of in the big picture and, like, the decision-making part. And then the other part is you can also use the term attention to talk about sort of how long you can point that laser of your focus, how long you can have task persistence or vigilance, like staying on something. Okay, so if you have uh, a group of kids, right, so what's this age here? Right, you have a bunch of kids in the room and it's like, all of a sudden you have, you're like, okay, I'm going to have my friend come in in a few minutes. And when my friend comes into the room, he's going to give you some directions about what I want you to do for this next task. Okay, so my friend that's about to come into the room is going to tell you what you have to do next for this activity, okay? And then the door opens and who comes in is my buddy, but my buddy's dressed up like a clown. He's like, okay, kids, you got to do this, 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 and this, and then he leaves. And like the older kids are like, okay, we got to do this. And the younger kids are like, did you see that that guy was a clown? Did you, but he had a red nose. It's like, well, did you hear what he had to say? It's like, well, and so that was like my kind of lame way of trying to say that like the younger the kid is, the more the the saliency or like the sort of similar to the word novelty how much something stands out is gonna s grab their attention and overwhelm them in the situation right so it actually takes cognitive control to not be overwhelmed that the person that told you directions was a clown that everybody notices that it's a clown the kid's not able to stop noticing enough to hear what the clown says and that inability to see to tell the difference between what's catchy salient and what's important or relevant is like one of the main differences right by the time the kids like seven or so they're able to hear the instructions and they're just like yeah that was kind of weird that it was a clown but like my three-year-old's like whoa a clown like it's like no no you're not understanding daddy they had a red nose it's like yeah 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 but did you hear anything that they said no like they were talking it's like so one of the differences is the relation of, of salient versus relevant, right? Like that things that are flashy are basically more noticeable necessarily than than things that are necessarily relevant or like important. And then the second thing is planfulness. So planfulness is a word that you don't really hear, right? Like usually you maybe hear playfulness or something. But planfulness, you can, it's one of those words that you might not have ever heard before, but 
it's just kind of basic. You kind of immediately know what it would mean that some, as kids get older, they're better at making a plan and using that plan to guide their behavior. So just like a really easy example of that is, um, you know, when you're growing up and you had like a, a, maybe it was in like some activity book and it was like, look at these two pictures and tell the difference between the two pictures. It's like, well, little kids will be looking kind of randomly at the two pictures. The older the kid is, the more likely they are to kind of start at the top left and like scan through the picture. And now it's like, okay, well, what's the difference between just randomly looking and scanning? Well, scanning is like a plan. It's like you're, you're, you're not scanning is like the opposite of random, right? Scanning is like you start here and you, you're trying not to like redo your steps. You're trying to scan the whole thing. It's more intentional. It's more planfulness. So as the kids getting older and as their memory starting to get better, one of the interesting things that's starting to emerge is this like autobiographical memory, right? This like idea of who who the kid is to themselves. Right? Like the my story of who Mike is. It's like, well, the idea is like that story didn't really start when I was born. That story started more when I was like two and a half, three. It's like some people will argue that they have memories a little bit before and it's so hard right because it's like well do you just remember your memory of a memory or do you have a memory and like how uh, your memory of a memory and the memory fire basically the same in your brain so there's almost like no way to actually tell if that's like the real memory or not so it's like at a certain point you're just kind of calling people a liar if you say that they can't go further back than that but like anyways without getting too down that road the idea is that at a certain point you start to understand that you're your own person and that your own person has sort of like this life story and that sort of becomes part of who you are. And the way I was, I could say this to you also, that's kind of sad, but you see sort of the flip of this with dementia and with Alzheimer's when people start to forget who they are and you realize that actually when you start to forget who you are, that's really dramatic and terrible in a way because you start to also forget who other people are and who they are to you and if you don't remember who I am, it's like, then the fact that I'm your son is less important or not less important, but less, I can't be your son if, well, I can't, this, it's hard to be your son in your mind if you don't know who I am in your mind. It's like the example I always use of this is like, I kind of stumbled into this again, but like the example, and I might've told this already, but with my grandma, when she was dying of, of Alzheimer's and like the time at the Christmas party when I'm sitting there and I was like her oldest grandkid. And she's like scratching my back and she's like talking to me. I was like an adult at the time. This was like only like 10 years ago or something. And uh, she goes, she's talking to me and like kind of making, like making normal sense. Like this was like a little, maybe half a year before she passed. And then my brother comes up and my brother's like talking to us for a second. Then he walks away and my grandma goes to me. She's like, oh, that's a nice lad. Who is that? It's like, ah. Uh, Right, because obviously it's my brother. She obviously knows who it is. Like, the fact that she asked me who it is showed that she's, like, not not with it anymore. And you start to realize, like, well, if she forgets who he is, it's like, that's, like, her grandson. That's, like, she's been to all his birthday parties. She can, she could have, when she was in a better state of mind, wrote a book about who he was. And now she's asking who he is. Right, like part of who you are is who you remember yourself to be, right? So that's like so much of what identity is, is it's like, well, you go through your life and you have experiences and you have patterns of doing things and you notice and you see yourself do that and you have an idea of who you are based on how you've seen yourself be and how you've seen other people react to you and it's some kind of wild combination of both of those things and other things too and it's it's also where a lot of our mental health issues lie in this like story we tell ourselves about who we are. It's one of the most advanced topics, really. As you, as we're getting older, I have here this like in my kitchen class. I, people, this joke always like always gets crickets. But I think it's funny because it's like <laughs> the mouse. This is like the COVID. 
it's a, this is like the the mouse is like for god's sake think why is that cat being so nice to you the cat's like leading him want to come for a ride on the, the car um no but that the mouse has given the warnings the crazy one and it's like Okay, so anyways, so I want to talk about critical and creative thinking. So thinking is, yeah, think about this. This is a wild way to think of thinking. Think about thinking about thinking about thinking. It said thinking is really the manipulation and the transformation of information in your memory. So it's like you thinking is like, okay, so it's like, what does it mean to say you're thinking? Well, it's like there's ideas or words or whatever, and you're taking those and you're using them and you're manipulating and transforming them and then you're somehow remembering parts of it and forgetting parts of it and it's this dynamic interplay some of it's critical some of it's that you're you're hopefully like processing your world right you're not just believing you're like thinking about things thinking about why that cat might be being so nice This is my third or fourth try on this slide, but I'll get it this time. So, convergent means to come together, right? So, say if there's a river over here, and I won't look in the screen, and then there's a river over here, and they come together, they converge. But let's say that there's one river, and then it, it splits, it diverges. So, think of converging meaning to come together, and divergent mean to, to split. And so... The point here is that a lot of the school system is sort of designed towards convergent thinking. I want you to be able to tell me that Sigmund Freud, for example, wrote Interpretation of Dreams in 1899. And I want you to tell me 1899, not 1879. And so that's like convergent where I'm looking for one specific answer. And that's a certain kind of memory, right? And that's a certain kind of thinking. That's like a certain kind of understanding. I need to understand what you're wanting. I need to understand the, situ the information and I need to be able to remember it. But then there's divergent thinking, which is like if I ask you a question like, why do you think Sigmund Freud is still talked about in current psychology classes? And do you think he's like overhyped or do you think he's not hyped enough? It's like, well, that's a little bit harder of a question because now you have to decide, well, first of all, like how hyped should he be? What do I mean by hyped? You have to figure out like I'm going to get a way bigger variety of answers with that question. You're going to take a lot of different paths to that. It's a much more divergent question. Right. And it's like some of these higher levels of thinking, it's like even though it's not necessarily what's like the school system focuses on, it's I don't know, that's why even with some of my assignments I try to give you scenarios where you can kinda of take a topic and run with it, at least with like sometimes this this uh yeah. This is not, this class, there's a, a few options for that, but like next term, I'm going to have a bit more. Sorry, Scotty, my cat's just, I need to clip his nails. He's, he lets me know when it's time to clip his nails by scratching at my, at my computer chair. Okay. Sorry. Uh, that got ranty. Next slide. Yeah. So this is kind of interesting. This like knowledge about knowledge or you're knowing about knowing, or you're co thinking about cognition, about cognition, or this idea of like, um, well, just think of like, sorry, my cat's like super interfering, and he's not, he's just like, cause I, cause my attention, right, it's like, my attention's getting stolen by the cat, um, Scotty, and he's looking at me like I'm crazy, he's like, why are you talking so intensely to the screen in front of you, there's no one on, he keeps looking on the other side of the screen, it's hilarious, he's like, there's gotta be someone else in this room on the other side there, cause Mike, Mike's looking at the computer like it matters, come on up, if you want, and, uh, so if I was to ask you if you're, like, ready to do the test, and you say, like, oh, I don't think I've studied enough yet, um, or if you said, yeah, I'm ready. It's like, that's actually interesting. Cause what that is, is it's you assessing your own mind, right? It's like, you have to, to answer that question. You have to think about how much you know about a topic. So it's you thinking it's you knowing about how much, you know, knowing about knowing. 
Many studies classified metacognition as metacognitive have focused on this idea of meta memory or about knowledge about memory. This includes uh, things like recognition that uh, oh things like recognition tests are hard, easier than recall. So that just means it's like easier for you to pick between a right and a wrong answer than to think of the right answer if you. That sort of makes sense, right? If I was to say like when did Freud, I just said when he wrote that book, when was it? That's a harder question than if I say, was it 1999 or 1888? Because in the question, I sort of gave you the answer, right? You're just picking between two. It's also uh, students' ability to monitor whether they've studied enough for the test. Conceptualizing a metacognition consists of several dimensions, how we plan, how we function, how we self-regulate. If you know that you're like upset right now and it's affecting your ability to like have a conversation with your partner, it's like that's actually pretty meta in the sense of like, well, what that means is you're actually able to. And if you're able to do that and if you're listening and it's this deep in and, and, and you're like one of my awesome students that actually cares really deeply, it's like that's like my best life advice to you. It's like you, if you can switch your experience from perception to perspective. Right? It's like everybody has perception. Everybody has their their life that they're sensing and then they're interpreting it, they're perceiving, right? And you're in a room full of people or you're in a relationship with your boyfriend or girlfriend and they have their perception too. But can you step even higher than that and take the bird's eye view of the whole situation and be in perspective? And can you see the dynamics of multiple perceptions at play in an environment and then you're playing chess when everyone's playing checkers so Bennett this guy in the picture is interesting because he was actually hired by the French government so in uh, uh, the French uh, military more specifically well he was hired by the Ministry of Education it says there in the note but this was for the military they're trying to decide if this is kind of interesting. So this is the history of where IQ tests come from. It was actually the French military trying to decide if there's a cognitive ability at which if somebody's lower than that, they're not worth training. And they basically decided that like if somebody's, I think, under a 60 in IQ, that uh, all the training in the world is not going to make them a, a serviceable soldier. Like the U.S. Army still has IQ cutoffs. So does the Canadian Army. So... What IQ literally is, is they tried to make a test that said, okay, people at this age tend to answer this level, right? So like the average answer for a 10-year-old is this, the average answer for a 20-year-old is this. So what we're going to do is we're going to take, now you're going to do the test, we'll get your score, we'll divide it by your age, and then we'll times it by 100. Right, so it's like, um, so say if I scored exactly average, right? So the, an average IQ score would be 100 and exactly average. So let me just do the math for you. I'm not great at math and I'm going to freestyle this a bit, but like, I'm just going to make it super easy. Let's say I scored 100 on the IQ test and the average score for 43 year olds is 100. So then I would take 100 divided by 100, which would give me 1, and then I'd times it by 100, which would give me 100 again. So that just was awkward a bit, but like, then that would be an exactly average score. So most people, so I would either be, if my, in that scenario, or in any scenario, if my score is higher than 100, then I'm higher than average for my age. And if my score is lower than 100, then I'm lower than my average for my age. But notice it's just my test on the score divided by my age times 100. It's an IQ. It's an intelligence quota. A quota is just a score. So your intelligence number, your IQ, is your... How well you do on the test divided by your age times 100. Yeah. It originally consisted of 30 questions ranging on topics from even being able to touch your, your nose or your ear to your elbow. And I guess it's just like... Can you even follow basic instructions to being able to do patterns and define abstract concepts? Bennett developed the concept of mental age, MA, an individual's level of mental development relative to others. 
A few year, year, le, uh, let me start again. A few years later, in 1912, William Stern created the concept of IQ, a person's mental age divided by their chronological age multiplied by 100. If someone's mental age is the same as their chronological age, so if your mental age and your like age age, like so my chronological age is 43, then a person's IQ would be 100. If mental age is above chronological age, IQ would be more than 100. If it's below, it would be less. That's just a smoother way of explaining what I was saying. So I thought you'd find this uh, image pretty interesting. So this is like... So you'll see how Bennett, that's the last name of the guy on the last slide, and then Stanford's just the university. So they use this test all the time at Stanford. And so they're, they're giving it to like thousands of people, right? Like um, all different types of people. And uh, basically all the first year psych students at Stanford in psychology every year. So if you look at this, it's saying that like, okay, if you look at who gets 100, and then this is like a normal bell curve distribution. So even if you haven't taken stats yet, you can see how like this bell, how it kind of looks like you could have a part in the middle. It's like ding, 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 right? And it's like the bell uh, wave or whatever. And you see how the middle line of the bell wave goes down and you see how it says under that 50%, 50%, 100, right? So let's look at that 100 for a sec. So it's saying that's the middle score. And then it's saying 34% of people score basically 15 points higher or 15 points lower. So if you combine those two numbers, that's like 70% basically of people, seven out of 10 people are gonna be basically between 85 and 115. Right, and that sort of makes sense. There's sort of like the average smart and then there's a bunch of people that are more than average and a bunch of people are less than average. And then the further you get from the middle, the less the numbers are. And that's sort of what you would expect with a well-designed test that's what you would call a normal bell curve normal distribution it's just saying it a different way symmetrical again it's like a lot of the stats words are just complicated ways of explaining the shape of the graph symmetrical just means that there's not like ups and downs there's like one nice like so normal distribution means it's just spread out normally Again, if this stuff was just said with a little bit, I don't know, that's why I sometimes I'm, I go too much on the breaking down words, but sometimes when you just kind of understand what the concept is, it's like the label's more complicated than the topic, than the concept. Okay, so there's other IQ tests, obviously, than, well, there's other intelligence tests. IQ is definitely the go-to. It's definitely the most um validated and widely used psychometric in the world it's not even close but like this welcher scale this is interesting right so you this is more likely to be used in a scenario and versions like this like a lot of psychoeducational assessments are like this where they're trying to kind of um maybe highlight specific areas where a student might be struggling so for example, this is going to be one where, yeah, maybe you're doing pattern recognition and maybe you struggle with that, or maybe you're really good at that, but then you really struggle with like the word problems. And this is where you'll hear like, well, this person has like a processing or like, this is where some of the language around developmental disabilities and stuff comes in. But this is really useful if you're a parent, right? Because for a lot of people, it's not that they're just like low intelligence, it's that they're struggling in certain areas, right? And that's kind of the idea of a learning disability that I was talking about earlier means that you're doing, yeah, if you had just low intelligence, it would be called low, uh, it would be called like um, an intellectual impairment, but it's, it's not that. It's actually that you have a high IQ, but you're not performing at that level because there's an issue with how you're learning, right? And they call that issue a disability, but that, again, it's like at a certain point, we're just arguing over the language. So people have like had other ideas about intelligence. <laughs> you may remember me from such movies as Slide 24. Um, yeah, it's always weird when I'm like doing these pre-recorded slides because I'll like take some time away for a second, then I come back to record, and it's like, does should I pretend like I'm like? 
just still sitting here or should I like say that I was gone for a sec or like do people not even care or like again it's just kind of weird okay anyways so I got a coffee if anyone cares and cheers to everyone um Sternberg I'll let you write this down real quick and that is crazy hot so Sternberg has this triactic theory right and again like just there's three parts. Triactic is just a fancy way of saying three parts. Um, and he's saying that there's like, okay, well, some intelligence is more this like ability to analyze and judge and evaluate and compare and contrast and kind of school kind of intelligence. And then there's this like creative intelligence, like the ability, as it says there, like these points I want you to have, like to create or design or uh, invent or originate or imagine. Then there's this like practical intelligence, like the ability to use tools and use and, and sometimes using tools means like using like literal tools and sometimes it means like using new technologies and sometimes it means like being inventive and putting ideas into practice sternberg says that children with different triactic patterns or that are just different in these areas uh tend to look different at school students with high analytic abilities tend to be favored in conventional school settings they often do well under direct instruction in which a teacher gives lectures and then gives a, objective tests Kids that are, are often con they're often considered smart and get good grades and do well on individual tests and later get admitted into competitive college student programs and university programs. In contrast, children who are high in creative intelligence are often not at the top of the class. Many teachers have expectations about how assignments should be done and creative intelligence students may not always confront or conform to those expectations. Instead of giving conformist answers, they, they often give unique answers that might get them marked down. Teachers might not be actively trying to, I'm reading a note, obviously, uh, teachers may not be wanting to discourage creativity, but Sternberg stresses that too often teachers desire to increase a student's knowledge actually indirectly kind of suppresses their th creative thinking. Like creative, like, uh, let me start that again, like children high in creative intelligence, children who are high in practical intelligence often do not relate well to the demands of school, however, many of them do well outside of the classroom. Right, often in roles like business or managers or politics or yeah, so it kind of comes down to this idea of like who does better on the test depending depends on what the test is measuring. It's like if the most intelligent person is the person that's best at doing patterns, well then you're gonna have a certain list of who the smartest people are. If who's the most intelligent person is the person that's the best in a difficult situation, well, then that's a different list of people. If it's who's the best at making a new idea out of nothing, then that's a different list of people. I do want to make uh, one point of caution, though, because all these, uh, these multiple intelligence ideas are interesting, but they're nowhere near as validated and like tested and tried and true as like actual the actual intelligence test. Um, sometimes people throw these around like they're they're all equivalent and they're they're just different. You have to view them as just they're different things. So this way of thinking of it, Gardner's idea is like that you can almost look at these. the best way for me to explain this to you would be to just think of this as different friends of yours, right? You might have a friend that's like really good verbally, right? Like the person that when you're all together having a beer or something, there's like the one friend that's probably telling the story and everyone's listening and laughing and they're just like an awesome storyteller. And there's someone that you like to talk to when you need to talk something through. And it's like, it's not necessarily that they're going to go public speak, but they're just good with words. They're good at communicating that way. They're verbal. They can express a lot of meaning through their words. Right. And then you might have another friend that's not as good at that, but that might be really skilled at math. Mathematical intelligence is probably the easiest one to explain. All of you can think of what that would mean. Spatial intelligence is kind of an interesting one, too. It's like my wife is really good at this. So like my wife loves doing like puzzles and she's great at like maps and directions and stuff like that, where I'm not as good at that. So that's like a spatial intelligence, like knowing where things are. right like and then there's like body kinetic where i'd probably be better than her at that one where it's like basically like sports and stuff right like some people are just a bit more 
natural anyone that's played sports or been in a gym class knows that there's some people in the class that are just more natural at it than others and so this is kind of the thing it's like it's almost he was saying it and this is where Gardner has like a pretty good point because he's not really trying to argue that it's necessarily intelligence he's saying that it's almost like viewing people as having you know you have different frames of pictures that people have different f- ways that they frame their mind that some people are more focused on different skill sets Again, I think like you miss, it's missing the point to say like, is this true or not? And to say more, it's like a way of thinking about it. It's just saying that people have different skill sets. They have different attributes and the different attributes that you have shape how you experience your world. Some people are more musical. That's an easy one. Some people are more, that's similar to kind of like the mathematical one. You just probably have friends that are good with instruments and you have someone like me that like can't play any instruments really it's like I I appreciate instruments and I love music but I don't have that gift or whatever right I don't have that frame of mind naturalist or like I have buddies like or I have a buddy I would say like my buddy Rob that like he he'll take you to like the best fishing spot he knows all like the stuff like that and it's like when you're out with him in nature you see that he has like it's a type of intelligence uh, this ability to like be at one with nature and some of you probably know what i'm talking about being out especially if you're living a little bit outside the city up there in the, the beautiful north shouldn't have taken a coffee mid slide drink but then six and seven right it's like inter and intra so like inter is between us so it's like do i am how skilled am i at negotiating my relationships socially and then how skilled am i at knowing when i'm upset and it's affecting me and hurting my ability to interact with other people what's my intrapersonal intelligence like yeah so i think like this is an important concept here that like a disability isn't low intelligence like by definition and i think the older i get the more i because i've taught this class not this necessarily this specific class but i've taught developmental psychology a long time it's the first class i ever taught like i've been teaching at conestoga now for like 15 years and i've been teaching this class like twice a year and uh i know at, at nipsing we call it like um advanced like lifespan development or whatever but the the underpinning theoretical content is still developmental psych it's there's a reason for that too it's incredibly essential for the field you're going into but it's so important for people to know that people with learning disabilities like it's if you and if you've been diagnosed with one yourself it's not that you're not smart it's like technically not that that you're at normal intelligence or above that the problem is usually in a specific area And it's in an area that's not diagnosable by something else. Right, so like maybe someone's really having trouble at school, but it's because of vision problems. And because of their vision problems, they're not able to see what the teacher's writing on the board. And so that'd be a scenario where that wouldn't be a learning disability. That'd be like a vision problem. So that's where like number three comes in. So when it's not something like number three, and it's not just an intelligence issue then what does that mean? Well, that means that they have an intelligence that would suggest that they would do better than they're doing. So the problem must be something with the learning. And it's usually in those areas that are blue, like in related to how they're either listening or take, so basically taking in information, concentrating, staying focused, speaking and thinking. Like those are both what you call processing, right? Because it's like you have to listen to it, think about it, and then say something. And when there's delays in that that's what gets called processing delays okay so i know these are like three especially the second two are really big topics and i'm just touching on them but like um so dyslexia or this this dyslexia is a, is a visual issue with how with how the individual sees the words and it's actually and it really affects like the ability to read and then you realize that that actually and spell and that you realize that those two things are obviously two flips right so if you're if you're reading things if there's a problem with how you're reading things and then you realize well okay to spell something you're basically just redoing what you read right so like you've learned how to spell the word 
or you've you've read the word a bunch of times and you're trying to spell it. So if you've read it the wrong way, it, you can see how a reading issue and a spelling issue are, will go together. Now, interestingly, what's been really helpful with dyslexia is some of this new dyslexia type that, you know, they can tell like where people with dyslexia tend to make the mistake and they've like actually created font that uh, corrects for quite a bit of it. Autism, I'm just touching on this like this, and I understand that autism is a massive spectrum that goes all the way from people that are in need almost constant care to people with high functioning Asperger's that are that are married with kids and that have full time jobs and are successful contributing people in society. So it's like I'm fully aware that it's a massive spectrum. Right, and we almost need to do like a whole section on that at some time, and then atten and ADHD or what used to be called ADD, and or this this idea of like attention just deficits again a massive, massive, massive issue. But this is where it would kind of fit in the conversation. I'm gonna contain myself because I can rant forever on the ADHD thing because. It's like there's so many issues around it and there's so many issues around like lack of diagnosis in females specifically. Um, but again, that's maybe a, just a topic for a different day. Okay, here I thought this is actually kind of interesting to you though. You see that there's like in kids that score really high in, in ADHD, you can actually sometimes see some of this prefrontal cortex delay, right? And it's delay in the areas related to attention and it's about two years. So they can be up to almost two years behind their peers in terms of the areas that are related to attention, which is kind of fascinating because that's exactly what like the teachers of those kids would say, right? That like they're good kids, but they're, they can't stay focused. And if the kid's having trouble staying focused, you'd expect the part of the brain that is related to staying focused would be the part that's not as delayed I mean, not as developed, and that's exactly what we actually see in brain scans, which is pretty fascinating. Sorry, this is another thing I believe heavily in. It wasn't directly with thesis, but if you, you, know, you might not be interested, but if you are, if you put my name, Mike Mainland, uh, Kung Fu is inside the body. That was one of my teacher's favorite sayings. That's the name of my PhD thesis. And one of the things that, and you can find it online for free if, you, if you're interested at all. But one of the things I talk about it in, in it is like martial arts um, as a practice that has like a lot of relevance for ADD and ADHD. Right, anything that's like discipline based and physical. Because energy that's not burned off becomes anxiety. And play eats energy. I mean, play eats anxiety. Play eats anxiety. This joke works good in the class. I'll, I'll always be like, hey, I'll be like, um, hey, Chris, what's a, there's a wug here. And then there's a second wug. So there's two. And I'll get them to finish the sentence. And usually they'll say wugs. It's like, well, that's interesting that you, I made you say wugs, because wugs is a non nonsense. Ma it's a sec, buddy. I'm almost done. Wugs is a uh, wugs is a made up word that doesn't exist that your mind instantly made up in like one second. If I was like, oh, there's a wug, and then there's another wug. Then, then, then you would call those that there was two wugs, and it's like, well, because your brain knows how to make that rule, right? You know that like usually an S on the end signifies plurality, and uh, that almost always works, right? Now, what? You're throwing me off here, Scotty. I forgot my example I was going to use. I think I have it written here. Um, yeah, when a kid says that, uh, that they're, yeah, on both, that they have their boots on both their foots instead of both their feet, and you're like, well, it's called your foot, and two f foots would be foots, right? Like, the fact that we switch to feet, it's like, that's kind of actually a break of our normal rule, so it, it makes sense that kids make that mistake. 
so you realize that there's kind of multiple things here so phonology is this idea of there's sounds like and it's like Scotty honestly give me one second I'm almost done okay do you want to jump up on my lap so there's the sounds but then there's also how we morph those sounds and as kids are growing up they're learning how people are talking and they're also learning how the context in which people are talking shifts so this is a guy named Burko's work studying young children that they're way better than chance at guessing the ending to the world what makes Burko's study impressive is that most of the words in the experiment were made up children couldn't base their responses on remembering past times they'd heard the words that they could make plural or past tense like so you've never heard wugs before so the fact that you were able to say it immediately means that you actually understand the idea of adding the s to the end so since it's a nonsense word it shows that you're applying a rule not just saying something you remember which is showing that part of learning a language isn't just learning the words it's learning the rules that direct the expression of those words i confused even myself there but i think that makes sense all right hey, hey. okay so yes you don't necessarily have to have this all written down obviously but like i thought that you'd find this kind of cool so yeah if you could actually have these ones written down though so syntax are the way that words are combined to uh, form phrases and sentences right so you'd say like some rapper or someone that's like a really good lyricist has amazing syntax like their ability to combine wordplay and then it's like well semantics means like what words actually mean and then pragmatics means like how you use the words and you start to realize that like okay well speaking is really all these complicated things what are you doing don't just lick that electrical cord dude so okay careful you can play with the Loch Ness monster but no licking cords okay sorry sorry this has been a very cat heavy podcast or lecture um so yes yeah, so the idea is that there's a there's the phonetics right there's like the sounds that we make and that those sounds that we make we do it in certain ways and we pronounce certain we use the phonetics to make certain phonological sounds it's got to give me just a sec to explain and then we we have this morphability of our language this ability to say things in different ways to express things differently and then we we use those that flexibility to have this like this we use this flexibility to have this like uh well to wordplay to talk right and we call that the syntax and then we we do that we infuse meaning into those words with our semantics and then we use it skillfully with our pragmatics and it's all a beautiful circle within a 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 circle, within a circle. this is basically what we call learning language okay we're almost there six principles of language development kids learn the words that they hear the most right so there's like a frequency aspect um things that interest them so things that are meaningful they'll learn more when they learn it in a scenario where they care about the situation where they're involved when it's meaningful to them when they have clear information about what the word means when they're told the word in the proper context right so all those things are basically just saying like kids learn language better based on how it's presented to them when it's when they're presented with clear language in contents in scenarios where they feel engaged and involved that's the best for learning right and that's true for anything that's like an immersive learning environment So in recent years you've seen and you probably maybe have even done projects on this in other classes like this like whole language approach and 
I'm not like totally against it. I'm a huge pusher of phonics. I think like phonics is super, 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 super important. And then all these other approaches are like fine. Like whole language approach. Here's the thing. If you have a smart kid that's been exposed to a lot of books and already is decent with phonics, then whole language approach works fine. If you have a kid that has very limited exposure to books and has not been in a very uh, vocabulary rich environment, then whole language approach without phonics is a, a sentence to not learning how to read it's like you have to learn the phonics you have to learn the phonetics you have to learn how to sound out our whole language english is based on spelling sounds that and so yeah so really i'm not really arguing one or the other i'm saying that the best reading instruction is a combo it's like, yeah, you use whatever like the modern thing they're telling you at teacher college to like ways to teach kids to read. But don't ever forget for a second that what reading is, is and what all languages is learning what sounds mean. And so and learning how to spell those sounds. And so sounding things out gets you like 95 percent of the way there almost always with language and English. This whole language approach is like is different i think i just switched to the next slide but i think that's okay okay so let's go over these chapter points um and we'll just wrap up okay so key points as kids grow they lose their the top heavy appearance this is getting back to physical stuff individual differences in growth are influenced by both where they their kind of origin or their genetic makeup and their nutrition brain development includes myelination synaptic pruning or that bonds idea i talked about and this increase of more localized activity, we talked about the prefrontal cortex. Development in the prefrontal cortex is especially critical for planning and other areas of executive function. Um, yeah, parenting quality and poverty, especially how poverty uh, influences nutrition. Gross and fine motor skills improve dramatically during childhood. Uh, I think I got cut off there. I was saying just growth and uh, gross and fine motor skills develop during childhood. Exercise and play are essential for optimal physical, cognitive, and social development. According to Piaget, in the pre-operational stage, children cannot yet perform operations. Right? And so we were talking about how this stage is characterized by this like egocentrism, animism, and the lack of understanding of conversion. Or conservation, I mean. By age seven, children enter the concrete operation stage. We'll talk a little bit more about that next time. And a couple more things here. By Koski's, we talked about his approach to development, that it's important to discover the kid's zone of development, right? This uh, ZPD idea. Information processing theories focus on how attention and executive function and memory change across childhood. Increases in knowledge and the use of strategies contribute to improved performance across childhood. Last page. Cognitive development has implications for daily life, including autobiographical memory. Right? So, like, eyewitness testimony, just this idea of, like, are you remembering the thing? Are you remembering your memory of the thing? Critical thinking, creative thinking, metacognition, all improved during childhood. Researchers have yet to agree on the best definition of intelligence. I kind of talked a lot about that. And then how does all these like kind of neurodivergent perspectives play in? Okay, young children increase the grasp of language, uh, not just by learning the words, but also by learning the rule systems. We talked about Burko. Preschool children learn and apply syntax and later semantics or like actually understanding the words young children uh, conversations skills improve in early childhood kind of obviously and early precursors to literacy and academic success develop in early childhood and we are done the presentation thanks for being an awesome class sorry uh i don't know i am who i am and i hope that you're happy and have a good day and i'll see you soon my friends cheers